Excuse me. All right, well, as I've already mentioned, we're looking at the last of, in our series on the great hymn writers of the church. Um, and uh, we've already looked, well, the first week we looked at uh, biblical justification for singing hymns, remembering that um, we are only to do those things in worship which the Lord commands. So we want to make sure that, that that's what the Lord desires of us. And we saw that, in fact, we are to be uh, singing hymns. We are to be uh, worshiping the Lord in the light of new covenant truth. Uh, and uh, certainly we are still to sing the Psalms. Those are inspired songs. But uh, with the clear light of the new covenant, uh, we have uh, a greater understanding. And we certainly want to worship the Lord for those great works. We do need to make sure that what we sing, though, is uh, according to God's word, that it's accurate, that we represent God accurately, that we represent Christ accurately, that we express those uh, desires and petitions that we ought to be lifting to him, that we're authorized to lift, and uh, not just simply offer him anything that we desire. Certainly it's not a, a blank check to do whatever we want. Well, this evening we're going to be looking at the life of Horatius Bonner. We've already covered um, the lives of Isaac Watts and uh, Charles Wesley, and last week, John Newton. Uh, Horatius Bonner, here we are sort of taking a step forward in time. As a matter of fact, I believe that uh, Newton died in 1807. Horatius Bonner was born in 1808, so we are looking at a couple of generations ahead. Well, this uh, I should mention at the outset that this particular um, biography that we're looking at uh, comes from a, a work written by Haken and Brooker called Christ is All. One of the things we're going to find and one thing that I found as I began to research the life of Bonner was that there were no biographies written <laughs> of, uh, of Bonner. Uh, the reason being is that he uh, strongly uh, urged and, and uh, requested that no one write a biography after he died. He wanted to be remembered uh, by his works, and he didn't want to be uh, idealized, as uh, often men are uh, in biographies. However, there were some materials left behind, uh, some things that he had written, I think a sermon on his death, uh, some other um, biographical notes uh, that survived, and so there is enough to get a pretty good picture uh, of his life. So let's go ahead and begin a little bit of introductory material. The remarkable spiritual awakening that took place at Cambuslang. And by the way, there's a lot of Scottish uh, words in this uh, because he is from Scotland and undoubtedly I will mispronounce some of them, but I will do my best. See, the remarkable spiritual awakening that took place at Cambuslang in, uh, at the time five miles southeast of Glasgow in the spring and summer of 1742 is well known in the annals of revival. It began in the February of that year with the anointed preaching of William McCulloch, the parish minister, and grew to the point that in July, George Whitfield, the leading evangelist of the 18th century, was preaching to crowds of 20,000 or more. Among the other ministers who also preached during those stirring days was one whom Whitfield called good old Mr. Bonner. The preacher to whom Whitfield referred was the minister of Torficken on the outskirts of Edinburgh, John Bonner a man who had a lively zeal for the interest of true religion. The revival appears to have given Bonner, who was quite infirm and unable either to ride or to walk any distance at all, a new lease on life. And though he took three days to travel the 20 miles or so from Torficken to Camislang, he preached three times when he got there with, it is said, great life. When he was about to return home, so filled with joy was he that he used the words of another aged saint for his farewell. Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. John Bonner's evident longing for and delight in revival would characterize at least three of his great-great-grandsons who were also ministers. John James Bonner, ordained the minister on August the 20th, 1825, of St. Andrew's Parish in Greenock where he remained until the end of his long life. Uh, by the way, I don't have a picture of him. This is Horatius Bonner, uh, the subject of the book, and Andrew Alexander Bonner. These two men were uh, brothers. Actually, there were three, three brothers. Uh, Greg had mentioned this morning uh, uh, about the connection between the, the Bonners, between Horatius and Andrew. They were brothers, and we'll find that uh, uh, Robert Murray McShane was also a contemporary 
and they knew each other very well. Andrew Bonner, a number of whose books became devotional classics among Calvinistic evangelicals. These three Bonners were also brothers who maintained close ties throughout their long lives. For instance, they frequently preached for each other during communion seasons. G.N.M. Collins, for a number of years, professor of church history in the Free Church College on the Mound in Edinburgh, knew some aged members of the Greenwich Church who vividly recalled from their youth the communion service in which all three brothers spoke, one on Christ as prophet, one on Christ as priest, and the third on Christ as king. Little wonder it was a service long remembered. At the outset, a major difficulty confronts anyone seeking to study Horatius Bonner's life and piety, namely the fact that there has never been an English biography written of him. In one sense, this is quite unusual, for the world of 19th century British evangelicalism reveled in big biographies of those who were key figures in their community. In another sense, though, it is quite understandable since Bonner himself gave strict instructions to his family and executors that there was to be no biography written of his life. However, in the 20 years following his death, there did appear three items that helped any would-be student of the life of this godly Scottish Presbyterian. Horatius Bonner, D.D., uh, a memorial uh, contains funeral sermons preached by admirers of Bonner at the time of his death, some of Bonner's own sermons, and the first few pages of an autobiographical sketch that Bonner drew up in 1888, to celebrate his jubilee as a minister of the gospel, but but which was never finished. Then there is the memories of Dr. Horatius Bonner, which consists of various short reminiscences about Bonner as a Christian and about his ministry and theological convictions. Most of them are written by those who had known Bonner, like David M. McIntyre, a colleague and successor of Horatius' younger brother, Andrew, in Finiston, Glasgow, Finally, there is an essay, Horatius Bonner and His Hymns, uh, written in 1904, which was written as an introduction to a large selection of his hymns by his only son to survive him, Horatius Ninian Bonner. As Ian Murray notes, Bonner's prohibition of a biography about his life stems from a desire for privacy and a fear of the flattery that often accompanies biographies. For him, what was most important was the work he had been given, and he wanted no other memorial. So what do we know about uh, Bonner? First of all, his early years. Horatius Bonner was born in Edinburgh on December the 19th, 1808. His parents, James Bonner, the deputy solicitor of excise in Edinburgh, and Marjorie Maitland, had nine children who survived infancy. James Bonner was an elder in Lady uh, Glenorchy's Chapel, a bulwark of Edinburgh evangelicalism that had been founded in 1774 with money donated by Lady Glenorchy, uh, a wealthy patroness of evangelical causes. Uh, I think for the most part I got uh, pictures uh, that uh, are accurate representations of what I'm hoping they are. This is the chapel she built. Of course, this is a portrait of her. Uh, There's a couple I have that, that may be doubtful. However, James Bonner died when Horatius was only 13, and thus the greatest influences on him during his early years were a godly mother and his eldest brother, James, who, like his father, would be an elder at Lady Glenorchy's Chapel and would be deeply involved in numerous evangelical and philanthropic enterprises. There are no known details, however, of Horatius' conversion, though his brother Andrew mentions in his diary that Horatius first took the Lord's Supper on January the 3rd, 1830. With regard to his education, he was educated at Edinburgh High School and Edinburgh University before entering Divinity Hall. By the way, uh, this is the Royal High School. It was the only one I could find in Edinburgh. If you look at these edifices, they almost look Roman. But a lot of the buildings seem to have this type of architecture. I believe this is the high school and this is the university. And then Divinity Hall, this was one I wasn't quite sure about. Um, I believe this may have been at a later time, so it may not be the right, uh, the right building. But he went to the high school and university before entering Divinity Hall, where the professor of divinity was Thomas Chalmers, this gentleman here, whom the Scottish literary figure Thomas Carlyle pronounced to be the chief Scottish man of his time. 
Chalmers had an enormous influence upon the young Bonner. As another of Chalmers' students later said of him, we never met with an individual who had the power Dr. Chalmers possessed of lifting the mind above earthly views. Chalmers is chiefly remembered for his key role in the events that led to the formation of the Free Church of Scotland in 1843, but his influence should by no means be limited to those events. For instance, it was from among Chalmers' students that the first generation of Church of Scotland missionaries to India came, of whom the most notable is Alexander Duff. Chalmers was also convinced that all truth was God's truth and that the Christian faith should relate and be applied to every aspect of society. Now, that is a true statement. We just need to be careful how we use that. All truth is God's truth. If it is true, that's certainly correct. But we don't want to assume that whatever anyone thinks is true is necessarily God's truth, and I'm sure that's not the way he understood it. His funeral in 1847 was a national event, drawing thousands of mourners from across every spectrum of Scottish life. If Horatius Bonner and his fellow students loved the gospel before they entered the seminary, it is certain that 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 love was greatly increased by sitting at the feet of Chalmers. Their subsequent ministry was deeply and lastingly enriched by having sat under Chalmers' teaching. Horatius Bonner considered Chalmers the greatest Christian he had ever known. Another important influence on the young Bonner as well as on his younger brother Andrew were some lectures on the book of Revelation that were given in Edinburgh over the years 1828 to 1830 by Edward Irving. At the time, Irving was one of the most popular Presbyterian preachers. In 1833, though, he would be removed from the ministry of the Church of Scotland for espousing the view that Christ's humanity was so one with that of all human beings that he possessed sinful inclinations. In Irving's estimation, only Christ being indwelt by the Holy Spirit prevented him from actually sinning. You know, that view is, is, I believe, the view of the Roman Catholic Church on the matter. But we believe that Christ uh, did not take upon himself a sinful nature, which is what uh, Irving seems to be teaching. He took upon himself the likeness of sinful flesh, but he himself was without sin. Now, certainly Irving believes that, but it wasn't just the Spirit of God coming upon him that enabled him not to sin. Horatius Bonner, though, would have agreed with his friend Robert Murray McShane when the latter described Irving as a holy man in spite of all his delusions and errors, which is quite interesting uh, because, um, you know, the, the tendency... In, in many circles, especially where you take theology very seriously, is to condemn a man who would hold such a, a deviant view. But uh, apparently their, um, uh, their charity extended uh, even to that degree. I guess they considered him uh, to be just mistaken on that point, a holy man in spite of all his delusions and errors. Andrew Bonner later recalled that the influence that Irving's premillennial convictions had on him and his brother and a few other students... May I tell you the history of some of us in Edinburgh? It is about 60 years since I myself felt the first thrill of interest in the subject when Edward Irving was preaching in the city. He had lectures at 7 in the morning during the time of the General Assembly for two or three years in succession on prophetic subjects. We used to go at 6 in the morning to get a good seat. But I remember what led me to, to, to decision that, uh, excuse me, but I remember what led me to decision was the calm reading of Matthew 24. That chapter decided me on this subject. I could not see a footbreadth of room for the millennium before Christ comes in the cloud. It is wave upon wave of tribulation till the Son of Man appears. I think uh, not, not wanting to be disrespectful to Andrew Bonner, as you know, we did take a look at Matthew 24 at some length as well as uh, the eschatology of the New Testament and the Old Testament and uh, if, if he were right, if that was describing the events leading up to Christ's second coming, uh, we would agree with him. But uh, uh, we saw that, that it very well uh, refers to um, uh, 70 AD, uh, to Christ's coming in judgment against Jerusalem, which if it took place back then, there would be uh, no obstacle to the millennium taking place before Christ returns. The long-lasting influence of Irving's lectures on Horatius in particular can be seen, for instance, in the Quarterly Journal of Prophecy, 
The publication that he edited from 1849 to 1873 and that was designed to promote premillennial eschatology. More than a few of his hymns also sought to press home this prophetic perspective. A good example is, I know not in what watch he comes, written in mid-March 1880. The first stanza and final two run thus. I know not in what watch he comes or at what hour he may appear, whether at midnight or at morn or in what season of the year, I only know that he is near. The centuries have gone and come, dark centuries of absence drear. I dare not chide the long delay, nor ask when I hear, uh, when I his voice shall hear, I only know that he is near. I do not think it can be long till in his glory he appear, and yet I dare not name the day, nor fix the solemn advent year, I only know that he is near. So, again, you can see that coming out. It's quite likely that Edward Irving's uh, lectures and his influence upon the Bonners and probably upon uh, Great Britain in general may be the reason why Spurgeon himself also was premillennial. A third important influence with regard to Horatius Bonner's spiritual growth during his days at the Divinity Hall came from a circle of friends that included two of his brothers, John James, which, again, I don't have a picture of, and then Andrew, whom we've already seen, Robert McShane, this gentleman here, Andrew Neil Somerville. And, uh, well, he's later minister of Anderson Church, Glasgow, and a full-time evangelist from 1877 onwards. And John Milne, uh, later the uh, minister of St. Leonard's in Perth, and whose biography Horatius Bonner wrote after Milne's death. And a number of other young men. Ian Murray notes that Horatius appears to have been the leader among this group of students. Something of the way in which this group of friends served as spiritual mentors to one another can be seen in the following two extracts from Andrew Bonner's diary, both from the year 1835. Saturday, May the 30th, in a walk round Duddingston Lock with Robert McShane and Alexander Somerville this afternoon, we had much conversation upon the leading of providence in future days. We sang together, sitting upon a fallen oak tree, one of the Psalms. Friday, August the 7th, this morning had an interesting and very useful conversation with John Purvis uh, regarding the importance of looking for all comfort and joy entirely and alone to Christ's work and not to ourselves or our frames. Bonner's ministry at St. John's Leith, 1833 to 1837. After being licensed to preach in 1833, Horatius Bonner's first ministerial appointment was at Leith, the port of Edinburgh, where he worked as an assistant minister to James Lewis in the parish of St. John's. Bonner had the responsibility of running the Sunday school in which younger brother Andrew also served for a while as a teacher and doing mission work in a very rough area of Leith. The latter especially involved house-to-house -house visitation in the medieval core of the port which consists of a maze of narrow streets and lanes. These are uh, modern-day pictures of the port area of Leith. This, I believe, is a uh, drawing of what it was like in, in Bonner's day. Simply from a physical standpoint, it was arduous work in that he had to ascend hundreds of stone staircases to knock on the doors of the various homes. Lewis secured a hall in which Bonner could also give public addresses twice on a Sunday to about 200 people, in which the Sunday school could operate in the evening. At the first meeting in the hall, the congregation was startled at one point by the entrance of one whom Bonner described as a furious woman who came into the hall yelling, My curse and the curse of God be upon you. But as Bonner noted, the curse did not come, and instead there was rich blessing. Whenever we do the Lord's work, as we saw this morning, people will be troubled when Christ comes. And sometimes uh, the trouble it causes for some people causes them to express sin rather than repentance. Bonner's ministry at North Parish Church, Kelso, 1837 to 1866. Word of Bonner's effective preaching came to the ears of a newly established congregation in Kelso, the North Parish Church, which sent a deputation to hear Bonner preach and sound him out regarding a call to their church. Unanimously called to this work on November the 30th, 1837, Bonner would labor in the Scottish borders for 29 years. 
On a ministerial level, it was at Kelso that Bonner's gift as an evangelist blossomed. The key note that he sounded right from the start of his Kelso ministry was, you must be born again. Bonner was rightly convinced that without this emphasis from the pulpit on the vital need for personal regeneration, all religion is hollow and superficial. The work eventually grew to the point that two assistant ministers had to be taken on to help in the evangelistic work, not only in and around Kelso, but also throughout the counties of Roxburgh and Berwick, as well as in the neighboring county of Northumberland in England. The work was not without opposition, though. As Bonner wrote, many rebuffs we got, many angry letters, many threats of ecclesiastical censure, much experience of what would now be called boycotting. But in spite of all this, the work went on. Good was returned for evil. And the evangelists found themselves and their message becoming more and more acceptable. One of Bonner's successors at Kelso was W. Robertson Nicole, who was minister there from 1877 to 1885, and who later became a well-known author and journalist. Nicole noted that Bonner's ministry at Kelso was one of quenchless zeal and unrelenting labor. He set himself to evangelize the borderland. His name was fragrant in every little village and at most of the farms. He conducted many meetings in farm kitchens and village schoolrooms and often preached in the open air. The memory of some sermons lingered. The chief characteristic of his preaching was its strange solemnity. It was full of entreaty and of warning. Dr. Bonner, uh, Bonner exhibited with faithful simplicity and decision the great things of the gospel, but he was never content without applying them to the consciences of his hearers. In his discourses, his poet soul often had its way, and I have heard some of them described as almost lyrical, but he seemed to fear decoration and adornment, and the main characteristic of his style was its austere simplicity. Writing and revival. Bonner was also convinced of the importance of Christian literature as a vital means of evangelism and Christian nurture. To that end, he began writing while at Kelso a series of tracts and small booklets that, he, that could be printed cheaply and widely distributed. From the titles of those written by Bonner, for example, Believe and Live, The Well of Living Water, Luther's Conversion, The Lord's Supper, Do You Go to the Prayer Meeting? It can be seen that they cover a variety of subjects, but a central theme is evangelism. Other authors, including his brother Andrew, were also involved, and the series became known as the Kelso Tracks. A snippet of the publishing history of one of these tracks alone, Believe and Live, can help one gauge something of the extraordinary impact of these booklets. It was first printed in 1839. Seventy years later, it was estimated that a million copies of it had been put into circulation. These tracks opened the way for other literary endeavors. In 1844, his first book, The School of the Prophets, or Training for the Ministry, later issued under the title Words to Winners of Souls, appeared. It was followed by a flow of books, sermon collections, and biographies from the ceaseless activity of his pen. As his friend Alexander Somerville put it, as he put it, ceaseless activity of his pen. In addition, he was also involved in the editing of a number of periodicals, including the Quarterly Journal of Prophecy mentioned above and the widely read Christian Treasury. His hymns, the literary endeavor for which he is probably most remembered today, are discussed below. A recent statement in the introduction to a reprint of one of his books well sums up the significance of this literary ministry. Bonner was clearly one of the most valued evangelical writers of the 19th century, and he has to be bracketed with J.C. Ryle and C.H. Spurgeon in his understanding of the power of the press and in putting it to extensive use. This writing ministry came at a time when Scotland was hungry for the word of God and its exposition. In the late 1830s and the early 1840s, Scotland knew general, excuse me, genuine revival, Beginning at Kilsyth in late July 1839, it soon spread to other areas of the lowlands. Dundee and Perth were especially affected, and from there to the rest of Scotland. In Dundee, the revival was centered on St. Peter's, 
the ministerial charge of Robert McShane, though McShane himself was away on a mission trip to Palestine with Andrew Bonner when the revival began. Throughout much of August and the early months of autumn that year, crowded meetings were held every day with considerable numbers in distress about the state of their souls and subsequently professing salvation. St. Leonard's in Perth, where Horatius Bonner's friend, John Milne, was the minister, saw similar scenes of spiritual blessing. Throughout the early months of 1840, two services were held there every day, with the evening ones lasting up to four hours. Although Horatius Bonner in Kelso was not at the epicenter of this spiritual awakening, he and his congregation were not untouched in this time of remarkable blessing. As he summed up this move of God, during this season there were all the marks of a work of God which we see in the account given of the preaching of the gospel by the apostles. The multitude was divided. Families were divided. The people of God were knit together. They were filled with zeal and joy and heavenly mindedness. They continued steadfast and increased in doctrine and fellowships, being daily in church and in prayer meetings, and numbers were constantly turning to the Lord. Seems as though this also was a prelude to what comes next, the disruption of 1843. In some ways, this, re this time of revival was preparation for the storm. For in 1843, there occurred what Stuart J. Brown calls the most important event in the history. Turn this page. In the history of 19th century Scotland, namely the disruption, which cut the Church of Scotland in two. On the day when the split actually took place, May the 18th, Andrew Bonner wrote in his diary that it was a day which will be memorable in the world till the Lord come. A week later, he called it an event of deep solemnity. Two issues were central in this momentous event. First, whether or not ministers could be imposed on congregations at the wish of patrons, even when such settlements were contrary to the will of the congregations. Second, in connection with their objections to patronage, evangelicals wished to revitalize the idea of a man being called to the ministry. Uh, I hope you understand what both of those mean. In this case, uh, patrons apparently were supporting the church and were paying the salary of the minister. Uh, they believed at that time, uh, at least some, and this is what was being objected to, that the patrons could actually uh, force settlements of ministers onto the congregation contrary to what the congregation desired. And, of course, the second, you can see the connection with that, would be that um, they wish to um, uh, revitalize the idea of a man being called to the ministry uh, by the congregation. The congregation would... Uh, uh, listen to the man preach. Of course, the presbytery would test the man's knowledge and uh, somewhat of his gifts and whether or not he is fit. The congregation would have the last decision with regard to whether or not they would call that person. Uh, basically, that's, this, this is the way we do it uh, in uh, the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, uh, undoubtedly uh, as an extension of what took place here as well, although the uh, Presbyterian Church was already established in America by this time. So this was the, um, uh, the, the crux uh, of the matter. Those who wished to uphold the practice of parish patronage appealed to the civil courts, while Thomas Chalmers let those who, wishing to honor the sovereignty of Christ over the affairs of his church, uh, maintained that the civil courts had no jurisdiction in the spiritual realm. Horatius Bonner gave voice to the view of the latter group when he stated in November 1842, that, quote, the whole contest has been concerning the laws of Christ, more especially those pertaining to the choosing of ministers and the government of his church. We have held that Christ's people ought to have the calling of their ministers and that it is through them, that is through his people, that he expresses his mind so as to point out the fitting pastor and not through the presbytery or the patron. Again, we have held that Christ's ordained office bearers are the only rulers of his church and administrators of his laws, with whose discipline, government, ordination, deposition, excommunication, no civil lawgiver or judge may interfere. The questions, then, on which the controversy has hinged have been such as these. Is Christ our lawgiver? Is he our only lawgiver? 
Has he really given us laws? Are we bound to act upon these laws? When Christ's laws and man's laws are opposed to each other, which are we to obey? Rather than abandon the church's independence from the state, Chalmers and those like-minded, including all three of the Bonner brothers who were ministers along with their respective congregations, decided to give up the privileges of establishment. In many cases, those who left the national church gave up salary and security. Manses had to be vacated. New places of worship found. Incredible hardships endured. All told, slightly more than 450 ministers out of an estimated 1,195 ministers separated from the Church of Scotland in May of 1843 to form the Church of Scotland Free, better known as the Free Church of Scotland. Somewhere between 40 and 50% of the membership of the established church went with the Free Church. In parishes where the minister went out, he was generally accompanied by most of his congregation. In the highlands, practically the entire church-going population forsook the Church of Scotland. It should be noted that the Scottish disruption had contemporaneous parallels on the continent of Europe. Seen in this perspective, it appears to be part of a general struggle in a number of areas of Europe to retain evangelical Christianity. Bonner's Ministry at Chalmers Memorial Church, Edinburgh, 1866 to 1889. Horatius Bonner's final sphere of ministry was in Edinburgh. He had received several calls to other spheres of ministry during his time at Kelso, but he never seriously considered leaving until called in June 1866 to become the first minister of the newly established Chalmers Memorial Church, later renamed St. Catherine's Argyle Church. He would be there until his death on July the 31st, 1889. His, his preaching, he preached up until a year or so before his death, and writing continued to maintain the utter centrality of the cross in the Christian life and to exalt the absolute sufficiency of Christ for the sinner. In 1888, when he celebrated his jubilee as a minister, he referred to 22 checkered years of ministry in Edinburgh evidently a reference to the fact that his ministry, like any faithful ministry, had involved blessings and problems, triumphs and setbacks. But he hastened to add that amid all of the ups and downs of his time at Edinburgh, one thing had been constant. God has been gracious and has not disowned the work and the message. Righteousness without works to the sinner simply on his acceptance of the divine message concerning Jesus and his sufficiency. This has been the burden of our good news. Through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe are justified from all things. It is one message, one gospel, one cross, one sacrifice, from which nothing can be taken and to which nothing can be added. This is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending of our ministry. Sad and useless must be the ministry of anyone to whom this gospel in its simplicity is not all in all. This emphasis on the ongoing validity and stability of the apostolic gospel was a much needed one in the last 40 years of the 19th century when many in Britain were calling for making progress in theology and were actively discarding older perspectives. Bonner would have none of it. As he wrote at the outset of the preface to his 1866 edition of the Catechisms of the Scottish Reformation, quote, It is not from the mere love of what is old or national that I have been led to re-edit these rudimental standards of the Church of Scotland. I wish certainly to preserve them, but not as mere fossils for a museum, not as the footprints of an extinct race not as relics of an exploded theology or an obsolete religion. I would reprint them because of their genuine and unaltered value and as embodying truths which are quite as necessary for us as they were for our fathers. The truths of the Reformation are not obsolete. They are not old anchorage ground which the elevation of the coast during these three centuries has left dry. Nor are these catechisms old anchors from which the cables have been slipped 
and which have been left to rust on the beach or sink into the sands, superseded by modern inventions better fitted to abide the storm. The doctrines themselves are not ephemeral, nor have the formulae in which our fathers clothed them been proved to be either inaccurate or inadequate. Insofar as they do not fit in with the spirit of the age, there is room for fair inquiry as to whether the fault may not belong to the age rather than to the dogmata or their formulae. Close quote. Later on in this preface, she returns to the dangers facing those who would trade fidelity to past truth for present relevancy. It is a part of a long footnote, but it deserves to be quoted at length, in particular because of its relevance for our own day. Some well-meaning theological literatures, or rather amateur theologians, who patronize religion in their own way, are fain or glad to warn us of the danger of not keeping abreast of the age, as if we were imperiling Christianity by, being quite, uh, by not being quite so learned in modern speculations as they are. We should like certainly to keep abreast of all that is good and true, either in this age or in any other. But as to doing more than that, or singling out this age as being preeminently worthy of being kept abreast of, we hesitate. To be up to all the errors, fallacies, speculations, fancies, miscriticisms of the age would be an achievement of no mean kind. And to require us to be up to all this under threat of endangering Christianity or betraying the Bible is an exaction which could only be made by men who think that religion is much beholden to them for their condescending patronage and will only be accepted by men who are timid about the stability of the cross of Christ if left unpropped by human wisdom and who besides happen to have three or four lifetimes to spare. We may be in a condition for believing and even for defending the Bible without having mastered the whole deistical literature of the last century or the present. We may be qualified to accept the doctrine of sacrificial substitution, even though we are not up to all that has been spoken against it from Cain to Colenso. In attempting to keep abreast of the age, there is some danger of falling short of other ages. And we are not sure but that the object of those who shake this phrase so complacently in our faces both as a taunt and a threat, is to draw us off from the past altogether, as if the greater bulk of its literature were rude lumber, a mere drag upon progress. Old theological terms and scripture phraseology are set aside or, or spoken in an undertone or used in a loose sense. Sharp adhesion to old doctrines is imbecility, and yet defined expression of the new is avoided, the mind of the age being a transition state unable to bear the whole of what the exact and honest exhi exhibition of advanced Christianity would require to utter. Many of our young men are more afraid of being reckoned Calvinistic than Platonic. They shrink from bold and definite statements of Reformation doctrine, lest they should be pronounced not abreast of the age, stereotyped if not imbecile. Indefinite language, mystical utterances, negative or defective statements, which will save the speaker's or writer's orthodoxy without compromising his reputation for intellect and liberality, these are becoming common. Many are doing their best to serve two masters, to preach two gospels, to subscribe two confessions of faith, to worship two gods, to combine two religions, to grasp two worlds, they would fain be neither very evangelical nor very heretical. The perspective informing Bonner's thought is this passage, uh, in this passage, is that doctrinal error is ultimately a moral and spiritual issue, as he states in God's Way of Holiness in 1864. Error injures, truth heals. Error is the root of sin truth, that of purity and perfection. Now let's move on to Bonner's hymns. In the preface from which the above quotations are taken, Bonner also refutes those who would seek to oppose life and doctrine and argue that Christianity is primarily a life, not a dogma. Rejection of such a viewpoint can be found explicitly throughout Bonner's written works. 
It is also implicit in that body of literature for which he is most remembered today, namely his hymns. Bonner had begun writing hymns in Leith for the children who attended the Sabbath school that he supervised. There were over 280 of them present on any given Sunday. In one of his notebooks, he noted the names of all the boys and girls in the Sunday school. What struck him as he first watched them in 1833 during their times of worship was how fidgety many of them were. He soon came up with the idea of providing them with hymns of their own, set to tunes the children knew well and liked to sing. The experiment, as it were, worked, and he noticed a marked improvement in their paying attention during the times of worship in the Sabbath school. Just as the writing of small tracts had led to bigger literary projects, so the children's hymns eventually led, in 1836, to his writing hymns that were for the use of older worshipers. The first of these was the well-known hymn, Go Labor On, Spend and Be Spent. It breathes the evangelic, or excuse me, the evangelistic passion that characterized Bonner's ministry all of his life, and it ends, not surprisingly, on an eschatological note. Can, can you see that? Can you read that? Is that too small? What's, you can, or is it, can anyone can't, can't see it? Okay, for those of you who can't, this is one of the hymns we were going to sing. As a matter of fact, we're going to sing it now. If you can see those words, then go ahead and grab a hymnal because uh, it is in our hymnal. And I believe the words are essentially the same. Hymn number 584. Let's pause just for a moment. So this is, as already mentioned, is the uh, first hymn that he wrote for older worshipers. I think you can get the thrust of what he is saying, that we are to follow the example of our Lord Jesus Christ in laboring in laboring for the gospel, in serving the Lord Jesus Christ in our particular generation. That we are to labor while it is day because time is coming when we're not going to be able to do so. Perhaps he had in mind here the second coming, certainly had in mind the fact that our time on this earth is limited. So he exhorts us to speed the work and to cast our sloth, our laziness away. It's not in this way that souls are won. But while we are laboring, keep watch and pray uh, because the bridegroom is coming. So let's, uh, let's pause for a moment and let's sing this uh, as an example of Bonner's uh, hymns as well as an exhortation to us to follow the example we've already seen so far in Bonner. And by the way, we do have a little bit more material that we're going to cover after this. Uh, certainly. Brian, would you go ahead and turn the lights on? Hopefully it's a familiar tune to, uh, to most of you. Is that enough light, Michael? Okay, well, let's take a look at that. We may have to sing it then from the hymnal, lest we uh, end up getting disjointed from one another. 584. And so there is. Looks like it's been modified. We noticed uh, this morning as we were studying in the Sunday school, looking at one of Bonner's hymns, that uh, that hymn also had been modified. Somebody has added some additional verses. Um, okay. Let's go ahead and just sing the one in the hymnal. 584, the six verses.
Secretary, would you mind? Bonner went on to publish over 600 hymns and poems during the course of his life, a number of which have rightly led to his being re, uh, regarded as the finest Scottish uh, hymn writer of the 19th century. Among this number are such hymns as I Heard the Voice of Jesus Say, originally entitled by Bonner as The Voice from Galilee, his communion hymn, Hear, O My Lord, I See Thee Face to Face, and Not What These Hands Have Done, a rich meditation on the central emphases of Reformed thought. Okay, so that's, that's the conclusion then of uh, his hymns. Now let's, uh, let's move on to look at <clears throat> something of his thought. Christ is all, the heart of Bonner's piety. Bonner's devotional writings are the other literary works for which he is remembered today. Typical of these is one that was written towards the end of his ministry at Kelso, um, has a succinct single-minded focus on Christ and provides an excellent vantage point for viewing the heart of Bonner's piety. Written in 1861, it is a preface he wrote to a minor 17th century Puritan classic that has been known by a variety of titles, Christ is All, the title used by Bonner in his edition of the work, A Guide to Eternal Glory, the title under which it originally appeared in 1685, and A Choice Drop of Honey from the Rock of Christ, the author of the work was Thomas Wilcox, 1622 to 1687, a Calvinistic Baptist minister who pastored a London congregation during the difficult days of the reigns of Charles II and James II, and who was imprisoned a number of times for refusing to conform to the Church of England. This is Thomas Wilcox and, of course, uh, Charles and James. Bonner had a deep love for that stream of reformed literature that came down from the Reformation of the 16th century through the Puritans to the evangelicals of the 18th century. And he wrote prefaces for a number of edition, editions of works from this reformed tradition. His preface to Wilcox's work may be divided into four sections. In the first section, Bonner argues that the Lord Jesus Christ is the gift of Godhead to us. It is the threefold love of the three one Jehovah that we find in this gift. In the first place, Christ came into our world because he was sent by the Father, and thus he can be thought of as <clears throat> the Father's gift. Moreover, he came into this world freely and out of love for poor sinners. Thus, Bonner argues Christ is his own gift to sinners. He gives himself to us as well as for us. He gives himself to us, not certain blessings merely, but himself. To the sick and weary and poor and dark and sorrowful, he presents himself as the one gift, the reception of which by us would deliver us from sin and want and grief. Bonner proceeds to note that there is also a very real sense in which the Holy Spirit is also the giver of the gift that is the Lord Jesus. When preachers urge sinners to embrace the salvation in Christ, they do so in the strength of the Spirit. It is by the voice of the Spirit, he writes, that this gift is proclaimed to us so that Christ is the gift of the Spirit's love as truly as he is the gift of the Father's love. Bonner further notes in this regard that the gift of Christ is not simply an expression of the threefold love of the Godhead for sinners, it is a gift that reveals the infinite evil of sin. The sinners for whom the gift is given are utterly guilty according to the law of God. The only way their guilt can be removed is for one to pay the penalty of their sin, and nothing short of the death of Christ can accomplish this end. Bonner thus emphasizes that the central fact in the biblical perspective about the gift that is Christ is not his incarnation, but his death for sinners. If mere incarnation could have done the work, would love have gone further and demanded something more expensive and terrible? If all that were needed was that the word should take flesh, would the bitterness of death have been added? It is in the blood shedding, the giving of life for life, that the real character of the gift is seen. In the second section of the preface, Bonner lists eight crucial things that God says in his word about the gift that is Christ. First, Christ is described by Scripture as the life of his people. As John 1.4 puts it, in him 
was life. Bonner stresses that all of the believer's spiritual life from its very beginning when Christ first comes into the life of one dead in sin and quickens that sinner to the believer's consummated perfection and glory comes from Christ. As he put it in his hymn, One Christ we feed upon, one living Christ. One Christ we feed upon, one living Christ, who once was dead but lives forever now. My life, my everlasting life art thou. My health, my joy, my strength I owe to thee. Because thou livest, I shall also live. And where thou art in glory, there I too shall be. Thou with us and thou in us, this is life. Second, as Paul maintains in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, Christ has been made the believer's righteousness. Christ's righteousness, the complete fulfillment of the law that was wrought through his earthly life, is given to the believer. As Bonner puts it elsewhere, Jehovah is satisfied with Christ's obedience. He is well pleased with his righteousness. And when we, crediting his testimony to that obedience and that righteousness, consent to be treated by him on the footing of its perfection, then he is satisfied and well pleased with us. Such faith knits us to the infinite worthiness of him in whom the Father delights. And so knitting us presents us perfect in the perfection of another. In one of his notes to Wilcox's tract, Bonner quotes from the 18th century evangelical Anglican John Berridge, quote, A robe I must have of one whole piece, broad as the law, spotless as the light, and richer than an angel ever wore, the robe of Christ. Third, Christ is the peace of his people. Through his death on the cross, he reconciles sinners and God, and he gives peace to the guilty conscience. In fact, not only does Christ give peace, but in the words of Ephesians 2.14, he is our peace. As Bonner explains, the knowledge of self troubles, but the knowledge of Christ pacifies and gladdens. The knowledge of sin terrifies, but the knowledge of Christ gives peace and drives away all fear. Fourth, according to such Johannine texts as John 1, 4, verse 9, and chapter 8, verse 12, Christ has come into this world as the light that drives away our darkness, reveals the Father and his love, and dispels the gloom from our lives. In the words of one of Bonner's hymns, he has come, the Christ of God, left for us his glad abode, stooping from his throne of bliss to this darksome wilderness. He has come, the Prince of Peace, come to bid our sorrows cease, come to scatter with his light all the shadows of our night. Then fifth, Christ is our wisdom, an assertion found in such passages as Colossians 2.3 and 1 Corinthians 1.30. Sixth, since unbelievers are utterly paralyzed for doing what is good, Christ is appointed to be their strength after their conversion. Moreover, Bonner affirms, because this human need is met in Christ, quote, God does not fill us anew with strength in ourselves, depositing it within us that we may use it at pleasure. Our strength, like our life, is deposited in Christ. He is our strength. And it is only by having continual recourse to him that we are strong. Bonner put this vital truth this way in one of his more famous hymns. I have no help but thine, nor do I need another arm save thine to lean upon. It is enough, my Lord, enough indeed. My strength is in thy might, thy might alone. Christ is also the believer's consolation and comfort. Bonner is quite aware that the scriptures, notably the Gospel of John, called the Holy Spirit the Comforter. But true to his Christ-centeredness, Bonner states that the comfort that the Spirit gives is drawn out of Christ. The Spirit comforts the people of God by opening up the unsearchable riches of Christ. Christ is the well, Bonner goes on to say, out of which he, that is the Holy Spirit, brings the drafts of abundant consolation with which he refreshes and revives us in our weariness. 
In God's way of peace, Bonner makes the same point in this way. Your medicine and your physician are not the same, yet they go together. Christ is your medicine. The spirit is your physician. Finally, Bonner argues, Christ is the believer's hope, hope for the future and hope of glory in heaven. As he stresses, our own doings are not our hope. Our feelings, our experiences, our evidences, our graces are not our hope. They can neither kindle nor keep alive the heavenly flame. It is Christ that is our hope. In the third section of the preface, Bonner looks at various ways that the scriptures talk about the relationship between Christ and his people. For example, Colossians 2.7 talks of Christians being rooted and built up in Christ. Jude 1 says that believers are preserved in Jesus Christ. These various descriptions of the connection between Christ and his people reinforce what Bonner seeks to show us in the second section of the preface, namely that Christ is all for believers. Thus, Bonner can exhort sinners outside of Christ to recognize that all that a sinner needs is to be found in Christ. For that which is in him is for sinners. Out of Christ there is and there can be nothing but what is evil. In him there is everything that the soul stands in need of. In the fourth and final section of the preface, Bonner reviews the way in which this testimony about the all-sufficiency of Christ has been faithfully maintained in the history of the church since the days of the Reformation. He refers to men like Martin Luther, Thomas Boston, and William Romain, and that's what we have here. And Bonner, having gone to his reward, can also be included among this line of faithful witnesses a portion of one of his hymns that clearly glories in the fact that Christ is all for the true believer forms a fitting conclusion to this introduction. And here we have ultra fine print. Just listen as I, as I read it. Not what these hands have done can save this guilty soul. Not what this toiling flesh has borne can make my spirit whole. Not what I feel or do can give me peace with God. Not all my prayers and sighs and tears can bear my awful load. Thy work alone, O Christ, can ease this weight of sin. Thy blood alone, O Lamb of God, can give me peace within. Thy love to me, O God, not mine, O Lord, to thee, can rid me of this dark unrest and set my spirit free. Thy grace alone, O God, to me can pardon speak. Thy power alone, O Son of God, can this sore bondage break. No other work save thine, no meaner blood will do. No strength save that which is divine can bear me safely through. I bless the Christ of God. I rest on love divine. And with unfaltering lip and heart, I call this Savior mine. His cross dispels each doubt. I bury in his tomb each thought of unbelief and fear, each lingering shade of gloom. I praise the God of grace. I trust his truth and might. He calls me his. I call him mine. My God, my joy, my light. In him is only good. In me is only ill. My ill but draws his goodness forth. And me he loveth still. Tis he who saveth me and freely pardon gives. I love because he loveth me. I live because he lives. Well, that's uh, the end of the presentation. Um, if someone would get the lights so we can see one another, that would be helpful. We're going to sing that last hymn in conclusion, but before we do, I wanted to ask if there are any questions or, or comments well, on the material we've seen. One of my comments is that... Um, that Scotland probably, the Scotch church was probably influenced by what was happening in England where they had a patronage system and the Anglican church had lost its zeal because they had ministers who didn't have a calling. If you went in, if you were aristocracy, the older son inherited and then the only thing that was acceptable, you went into the army or navy if you were a younger son or into the church. 
And so they had people who didn't have a real call, and often their living, their, they were supported by a wealthy person. It was called a living. And I think that started to creep into the Scotch church so that um, they started having the same system of, of having a wealthy person be your patron and uh, who actually would, you know, see that a person, whether what, regardless of what the congregation wanted, it's what you were saying. And uh, it was, you know, a bad system. So what you're saying is the wealthy patrons would probably would, would want to find a living for someone, but the man may not be worthy to be a minister. And they would impose them on the congregation. The congregations were saying, no, we don't want this man. We want to call someone that we want who's going to preach us the gospel. So yeah, it was, would be a um, very good reason to, um, to haggle and, and to split. Um, and we saw, of course, the, uh, the results of that. Any other questions or comments? Uh, Rob? You know, the thing I really appreciate about this brother is that he's so consumed with the Christ-centeredness of the Lord Jesus Christ and how central the Lord Jesus Christ is to the life of the Christian, the life of the church. And, you know, he's not going to compromise on that at all. And uh, I think that's just a good challenge to all of us to be like that. Certainly. Um, Good comment. That is one thing that uh, stands out about uh, Bonner and uh, the uh, Scottish Presbyterians, uh, I believe, in general, uh, very Christ-centered and something we can learn from. I saw a hand back there, but now I don't see the person who raised the hand. <laughs> it was one of the children wanted to find out. Oh, yes. <laughs> there you are. Well, let's see. Why do you want to know? <laughs> I believe the, the figure was around 600. What was the question? About, around how many, about how many hymns did Horatius Bonner write? Yes. Yes, Maureen. Uh, do any of his tracts and writings survive, especially the one on the Lord's Supper? You know, um, I, I didn't see which ones might be in print, but I did notice online that there's somebody selling the... Um, uh, basically a collection of his writings and it has it's supposed to be a complete collection of everything that he's written so it's available on CD I I don't doubt that books are in print that have some of his prefaces but I don't know for sure whether some of his works are still in, in writing or not uh, another um, question um, Luther I had a kind of a low impression of the book of James because it had to do with uh, um, it had, not, it had to do with uh, Faith the works. model of Christian living, you know. And um, I just wondered, um, what, what about, uh, you know, there's an emphasis on, on faith, you know, and, and, and everything. But how, what did Bonner think about works? How did he, uh, you know... I guess works follows faith, but uh, did he ever write about this, or what was his attitude? Well, I'm sure he, undoubtedly he preached and uh, wrote about it. Um, you know, I haven't read any of his writings to tell you precisely, but I, I can guess from what we've seen that um, he certainly believed in the holiness of the Christian. He, that's certainly what the Westminster Confession and the catechisms which he held to would, would, would teach that we're not saved by our works. Our works are merely the evidence that we're saved. And I believe he would also say, although we did read something tonight that indicated um, uh, the idea of our, our hope of heaven is not from our assurance. And our assurance doesn't come primarily by looking at our works, but by looking to Christ. And that was certainly something that was very fundamental to continental reformed Calvinism I believe the Puritans were, were very uh, strong on looking into their own lives to see what their works told about themselves. And I think what Bonner was trying to distinguish there was the fact that our hope of heaven is not in that I see that evidence within me, but my hope is in Christ, and again, kept drawing us to Christ. But I, I would guess from the things that we've seen that he would say our works are not meritorious, but they are necessary. They must be there. 
And if we are not growing in Christ, I mean, look at the, the hymn we just sang, Go Labor On, right? Uh, he, he believed that we ought to be giving ourselves fully to the work of Christ. Even though we're not saved by those works, you know, they will flow from a, a truly converted life. So as we would read the Westminster Confession, that would probably explain his, his attitude. Yeah, and what I've given you is, is the position of the Westminster Confession, yes. Any other uh, comments or questions? Yes. Uh, it's said on there that he, the local congregations could reject not only the patrons but the presbyteries. Is that the position of the Free Church of Scotland today? Well, it, it didn't sound like they could reject the, the presbyteries just in general, but that they, they didn't have to accept a man imposed on them by the presbytery. So I'm assuming that the, the Free Church of Scotland that that wouldn't be their practice. <laughs> the Presbyterians wouldn't do that. Um, in, in our denomination, that can't be done either. You, you can't impose somebody on the congregation. Uh, certainly not. We don't have patrons, of course. Um, one question that arose in my mind was, um, if, if they rejected the patronage, did they then begin to support their ministers through the giving of the congregation because the patron was the one who would provide the money for the person? And that was a nice benefit. And I suppose with the money came the attached strings, which was the imposition of the men that they didn't want as ministers in their congregation. So they probably had to reject both patron and, uh, and that imposition. But yes, they rejected the idea of presbytery also imposing a person on them. Yeah. Any in the United States, uh, well, it wasn't good. But in the colonies, uh, there were... The state decide, decided which religion, and they had official religion in Virginia. That was the Anglican Church. The official religion in Massachusetts was a congregational church, and you were taxed to support the church. <coughs> Interesting. And uh, I guess that came to, to an end with the Constitution. But anyway, that was kind of surprising to me. Any other questions or comments? Okay, I, I don't see any, so let's do this. Let's take our hymnals again, and we'll sing one last hymn by Horatius Bonner, and that's 461, the ones, or the one that, whose words I've just read. And why don't we uh, stand?